The first U.S. presidential election in 1789 was very different from the way Americans do presidential elections today. In 1789, there were no official candidates. There was no campaigning for the office. There were no political parties, no nominating conventions, no primary elections. The entire election season was very short. And the major issue of this election was the Constitution itself, whether the very system that they were using as the basis for the election, whether they would keep the system. Okay, well, you might be thinking, why were they electing a president for the first time in 1789? Didn't they declare independence in 1776? What were they doing for those 13 years? Well, they didn't have a president during those 13 years. Uh, it's important to remember that the United States of America was not originally a single country. It was a collection of 13 separate countries. The 13 colonies that were participating in the rebellion had each been separate from each other, distinct colonies with ties between themselves and Britain, but not really ties amongst themselves between the different colonies. So when the 13 colonies declared their independence, they did so not as a single unified country, but as 13 separate countries in association with each other, what we would today call an international organization in order to accomplish their common goal of freeing themselves from British rule. There was only one branch of government, effectively, on the federal level which was the Continental Congress. Although to call it the federal level is a stretch because uh, there wasn't a federal government, so to speak. Anything that the Continental Congress decided to do had to be enforced by the states. And if a state did not want to enforce it, they didn't have to. Some people at the time saw this as a problem and they thought that the states would be better off if they entered into a closer union with each other. Uh, this was mainly for financial reasons, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, so they held a constitutional convention in Philadelphia in 1787, in which they drafted the constitution that we use today in the United States. Now, this new constitution was different from the way it had been before. So under the old system, you had one branch of government, the Continental Congress. Uh, in this new system, there were three branches of government. There was the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. The legislative branch would consist of Congress, but now Congress would have two separate houses, a House of Representatives, which would represent the people directly, and the Senate, which would represent the states. And then the executive branch would be headed by a president, and then under him would be everyone who is in charge of executing the laws passed by Congress. And then the judicial branch was headed by the Supreme Court, and then there would be various courts underneath the Supreme Court. So one of the questions that the framers of the Constitution had to answer was, how are they going to get the president chosen? Now, one obvious choice would be to have him chosen by Congress. That would essentially make it a parliamentary system. Like in most English-speaking countries, there's a parliamentary system where parliament decides who the prime minister is going to be and the prime minister runs the government. The framers of the Constitution did not want to do that. And by framers, I mean the men who met in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 and drafted the Constitution. They're called framers, the framers. They didn't want to do that. They wanted to maintain a strict separation between the executive branch and the legislative branch. So that was off the table. So how else could they elect the president? Well, one option, which is the option I think most Americans today would take for granted, was that the president would be elected directly by the voters. The framers of the Constitution also didn't like that idea. They thought it would be not practical to do that and also not wise. So the framers hit upon another system that was neither of those two things. What they would have would be the famous electoral college, this body of individuals who exist within the executive branch, so you don't have to worry about cross-contamination with the legislative branch, and the electoral college's only job was every four years they would elect the president. Now, how do you choose the members of the Electoral College? Well, they just left that up to the states. However, the states wanted to do that. If the state legislature wanted to choose their electors, they could do that. If the state legislature wanted to leave that up to the voters to decide, they could do that too. So the American presidential election has two stages. First, you have to choose the electors. And then once the electors are chosen, they choose the president. That's still the system that's used in the U.S. today. And when Americans go to the polls in early November of an election year, they're voting for electors. 
And then the electors meet, nowadays it's in the middle of December, and they cast their votes for president, and that's the actual election of the president. So what we call election day is actually the election of the electors. The Constitution gives Congress the power to decide when each of those elections happens, when the electors are elected and when the president is elected. Nowadays, it's early November and mid-December. In this first election in 1789, the election of electors happened on January 7th, and then the electors would meet and choose the president on February 4th, 1789. So election day in 1789 was January 7th. That was what we would call election day. Now, some online sources will say that this particular presidential election happened over two years, 1788-89. It's not quite true. The election was January 7th, 1789. It was just in 1789. Where that's kind of true is in two states, in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. They actually had a two-stage process for choosing their electors. They would have voters essentially nominate who they would want to have as electors, and then the state legislature would choose from a list that the voters sent up to the legislature. So in both New Hampshire and Massachusetts, the voters went to the polls. Polls isn't the right word. The voters went to their town meetings and voted for who they'd like to be elector. And then those names went to the state legislature. And on January 7th, they the state legislature picked from among those that list. But in the other states that participated in the election, it was just January 7th, 1789. Now, there were 11 states that participated in the election of 1789. Rhode Island and North Carolina had rejected the Constitution and therefore were technically not part of the United States and not participating in the election. In five of the states, the state legislatures chose the electors. In four of the states, the electors were chosen directly by the voters. And then in two other states, they had a hybrid system. Now let's take a minute and look at the states that did direct elections. Uh, because they did it differently in the different states. In Pennsylvania and Delaware, they had statewide elections, meaning uh, in Pennsylvania, wherever you were in the state, if you were voting in the election, you voted for 10 names. And then the top 10 vote getters statewide would uh, become elector. Delaware did the same thing, but they had three electors. So wherever you were statewide, you voted for three names. In Maryland, it was also statewide. Everybody wrote down eight names because Maryland got eight electors. But Maryland had a rule where five of the names had to come from the western shore and three of the names from the eastern shore. Virginia did it a little bit differently because the Virginia legislature actually created electoral districts. Virginia got 12 electoral votes. And so the legislature divided the state up into 12 electoral districts. Each one would elect one elector. And these were distinct from the 10 congressional districts that Virginia had. Virginia was the only state to do it this way. So looking at the different states and the way they did it, that reflects the politics of the different states. So Pennsylvania, for example, the Pennsylvania legislature was dominated by Federalists, meaning people who were pro-Constitution. Support for the Constitution tended to be stronger in the cities. So they thought by making it a statewide ballot, it would make it more likely for Federalists to be elected as elector. The Virginia legislature was dominated by anti-federalists, people who were opposed to the new constitution. And they wanted to improve the rural vote. And so they drew districts to make it more likely that rural people would be elected as electors. And rural people were more likely to be opposed to the constitution. And this touches on the big issue of the presidential election that year, which was the constitution itself, whether the constitution was even a good idea. It was extremely controversial in a way that I think most Americans today probably don't really realize. Uh, but there were a lot of people who were opposed to the Constitution at the time, and the passage of the Constitution was quite controversial in several states. Some Americans felt like the Constitution was a betrayal of the goals of the Revolutionary War. They felt like they had traded one tyranny for another. They'd gotten rid of the tyranny of the British Parliament and the British monarchy, and they had now we're instituting their, a new tyranny of a new federal system. A lot of Americans, especially in rural areas and out in the western areas, were afraid that this new federal system would be opposed to their own interests, that the federal government would be dominated by commercial interests from the port cities, and would make policy decisions that would financially benefit the big port cities 
and disadvantage rural areas. In fact, this controversy between those who favor the Constitution and those who are opposed to it ended up making it so that New York could not participate in the presidential election at all because the New York legislature was divided. The upper house, the Senate, was majority Federalist. The lower house, the Assembly, was majority Anti-Federalist. So the Senate, which was 10 to 8 in favor of the Constitution, wanted each house of the legislature to choose four of New York's eight electors. The Senate would choose four and the Assembly would choose four. And that way, four of New York's eight electors would be pro-Constitution. The Anti-Federalists wanted the legislature to decide on the electors as a whole. So each member of the legislature would get one vote. They would have one slate of eight. Essentially, they would choose them in a joint session of the two houses. What that would mean practically is that all eight of New York's electors would be anti-Constitution. So the assembly would pass a bill saying, this is how we're going to choose our electors. It would go to the Senate. The Senate would say, no, we're not going to do it that way. They would pass their own bill that would go back to the assembly and the assembly would turn it down. It went to conference committee. They argued over it, uh, couldn't come to a resolution. This went on for weeks. Then January 7th came and they were deadlocked. So midnight, January 7th, they still hadn't chosen their electors. That was it. So they did not have electors. The same gridlock meant that New York had no senators because it was up to the state legislature to choose senators. So it took them until I think the summer of 1789 to finally decide who their senators were going to be. Um, a similar thing actually happened in New Hampshire uh, because New Hampshire's legislature was also divided in a similar way. But in that case, the anti-federalists in the lower house of the New Hampshire legislature uh, gave in and agreed to the Senate's terms. Um, so New Hampshire did, and it was very close to midnight when they made that compromise. So New Hampshire did end up participating in the election. Now this business of whether an elector was pro-constitution or anti-constitution, what was that about? The constitution ended up getting approved in these 11 states, but there were a lot of people who were uncomfortable with it. And so what they hoped they could do was get a second convention. That's what they wanted to have. They wanted to get a second constitutional convention that would draft a different constitution that would be more acceptable to the anti-federalists. Barring that, they could, at the very least, get elected to positions within the federal government and then undermine the federal system from within and thereby prevent the full weight of the federal government from coming into force, perhaps to make people disillusioned with the federal system and provoke them to agree to a new constitutional convention. Another thing was if you get anti-federalists elected to Congress, at the very least, they could be clamoring to get amendments. Now, when the Constitution was approved in the, in the various states, the pro-Constitution people promised, which seems a little bit shady in retrospect, honestly, but they said, oh, go ahead and approve the Constitution now. We promise we'll adopt um, amendments later. So people were voting for the Constitution with the kind of, with the promise in the future, it wasn't really binding, but with this understanding that in the future amendments will be adopted, um, which ended up happening. You know, that was the Bill of Rights, which came into effect in 1791. But that was the idea of electing anti-Constitution electors. They were hoping that if you get enough anti-Federalists anti as electors, then they could cause problems for the presidential election. Everybody knew that Washington was going to become president. They knew that actually back in 1787 when they were drafting the Constitution. George Washington was one of the Virginia's delegates, and he was actually sitting there in the room while they're all talking about the president. And it was kind of an open secret that they're creating this office, and George Washington's going to be the guy they're going to put in that office first. So the Federalists were afraid that anti-Federalist electors might mess up the election. And how would they do that? The framers of the Constitution created this system where the electors would vote for two people for president rather than one person. And then the person who got the most votes would become president, and the person who got the second most votes would be vice president. And the weakness of this system became apparent immediately because the way it's supposed to work is George Washington will get the most votes, and then John Adams will get the second most votes. Then you get president, vice president. Great. But what if George Washington does not get the most votes? What if he gets the second most votes? 
what if some anti-federalist electors decide not to vote for George Washington? Maybe they vote for Adams and then some other candidates, just some throwaway name. They could potentially throw the election to Adams, making John Adams the first president and George Washington the vice president. Now, the problem with that is Adams was not as popular as Washington, especially in the South. And so that could reduce the um, goodwill that the general public had for the federal government, right? And so that would help to undermine the federal government and therefore achieve the ends that the anti-Constitution people had. That was something that the Federalists were afraid could happen. Or alternatively, another possibility would be if there were enough anti-Federalist electors, they could get George Washington elected president and then an anti-Federalist elected vice president. Now, among the anti-Federalists, there were a few names, uh, but I think the most common name that was bandied about at the time was George Clinton. If you were an anti-Federalist elector, it was expected that you would end up voting for Clinton, maybe Washington Clinton or maybe Adams Clinton. You know, you could do that. So just to give you an example of a possible thing that could play out, the Federalist electors could vote for Washington and Adams, and then the anti-Federalist electors could vote for Adams and Clinton. And so then Adams ends up getting the most votes. Washington comes in second, Clinton comes in third. That makes Adams the president, Washington the vice president. Just as one example of many possible permutations of this. So the, the point is, the system that was written into the Constitution was a bad system. Having the electors vote for two names and not designate which one they wanted to be president, which one they wanted to be vice president, was a flaw. And people at the time recognized that as a flaw. So remember, there are two stages of electing the president. First, you get the electors, and then the electors choose the president. So the electors were going to meet and choose the president on February 4th. In the run-up to that uh, electoral college vote, some political figures in the country were trying to organize a system where they would make sure that Adams didn't get as many votes as Washington. And the most prominent figure in this movement was Alexander Hamilton. He was writing a ton of letters to different people. He was not the only one involved with this. There were a few others also who were writing letters to different states, writing to the different electors saying, make sure you don't vote Washington Adams. Make sure there are some guys you know, there who are going to vote for somebody besides Adams. So if you look at the results of the 1789 election, you look at the Electoral College votes, it looks like, you know, everybody voted for Washington, and then a bunch of people voted for Adams, and then there were a bunch of small vote totals for other people. A lot of those votes were deliberate throwaway votes where they would have voted for Adams, but deliberately chose not to vote for Adams because they were trying to mitigate against a potential anti-federalist scheme. In Connecticut, they had seven electors. Five of them voted for Washington and Adams. Two of them voted for Washington and Huntington. The votes for Huntington were going to go to Adams. They voted for Huntington as part of the scheme that Hamilton was organizing. In Pennsylvania, again, those two that voted for Hancock would have voted for Adams. In Maryland, there were eight electoral votes. Two of the electors could not actually make it to the election. Uh, the Electoral College meets on a state-by-state -state basis, so the electors in each state come together. In Maryland, the, the, the eight electors were supposed to meet in Annapolis to do their voting. Two of the electors couldn't make it. One of them was sick. He had gout and therefore couldn't travel. The other one was uh, unable to because of ice that blocked. I think he had to cross either the Chesapeake Bay or a river, and it was filled with ice, and so he wasn't able to make it to Annapolis. Only six electors in, in Maryland participated. All six of them voted Washington and Harrison. Harrison was Chief Justice of the Maryland General Court. He was not a national figure. They voted for him purely as part of Hamilton's scheme to make sure that Washington came in first and Adams came in second. They would have voted for Adams otherwise. Now, not all of these votes were like that. In some of the states, the electors really were voting for someone besides Adams because they didn't want Adams. They wanted somebody else instead. Uh, I think the votes for John Jay were like that. I think the votes for John Jay were legitimately for John Jay. I mean, I, I did a lot of reading about this, but I couldn't figure out exactly for every single state what the motivations were of the electors. But if I were to guess, and, and this is based on incomplete research of the election, I think the election would have looked more like this if there hadn't been so much strategic voting.
Now, this setup of the way the electors would vote for president, you know, voting for two names and not distinguishing which one you wanted to be president and which one vice president, this continued to be a problem in every presidential election after this until they fixed it. And they finally fixed it in the 12th Amendment, where they said that electors will say which one they're voting for president and which one they're voting for vice president. The election results really hurt John Adams. I mean, he didn't have any expectation of being elected president. He, like everyone else, expected Washington to get the most electoral votes, but he didn't expect to get as few electoral votes as he got. And he felt kind of devastated by that. It's kind of sad because it didn't have to happen that way. They didn't have to worry that the Anti-Federalists would pull off a scheme because they didn't. Uh, the, all the fears about anti-federalist shenanigans came to nothing. Uh, Washington easily got all 69 electoral votes, and Adams wasn't going to get more than him. You know, like there were enough people voting for Hancock and John Jay and Rutledge to uh, to prevent Adams from tying with Washington. So uh, it's kind of sad how that worked out. But anyway. Those are the election results. Uh, George Washington was elected president. John Adams was elected vice president. They both traveled to New York, which was the first seat of the federal government, and were sworn in in the spring of 1789 to begin their first terms, respectively. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this election. If you're an American, do you think it'd be better or worse to have our elections the way they were back in 1789? Um, if you're not an American, um, how much better do you think your system is compared to the original American system of 1789? Um, I do plan on doing a follow-up video on the next presidential election, 1792, when George Washington was re-elected. So stick around for that. Thanks for watching.